people watching on live stream. Delighted that you're here with us. Um, this morning I want to talk about wealth. It's a uh, top that I think gets short shrift from economists. All right, I got to figure out how to use this bumper. Boom, boom, yep. It's obviously important. Adam Smith wrote a whole book about it. But wealth, and especially wealth accumulation, doesn't get much love from economists, really. When I talk about wealth here, I'm talking about balance sheets, assets and net worth. There are other important ways to talk about wealth, but uh, I'm going to go straight accounting-based meaning here. Uh, terms defined by accounting identities. Uh, go with me on that for the next 15 minutes. Wealth is about balance sheet assets and net worth. Now, here's the thing. Until about 10 or 20 years ago, our national accounts didn't even have balance sheets. And, and they didn't tally holding gains, capital gains, which you need in order to tally changes in net worth. Now, I'm not, definitely not the first person to notice this. Dirk Besmer and Michael Hudson say it very strongly here. Um, that emphasis is mine, by the way. Holding gains are invisible in the NIPAs and the flow of funds accounts. But to go even further, wealth is also invisible. Much or most of economics that I see out there uh, and economic modeling still operates in that pre-balance sheet world. MMT models stand out really nicely this way. They do incorporate wealth, though generally only by setting expectations for future income by agents. That's how wealth is generally incorporated in the uh, godly Lavoie uh, models in Gennaro Zazi's um, models, et cetera. Um, but anyway, it's a huge improvement over Keynes, which only includes income. In its, con in its consumption function. Now, I'm not an expert on M SCF, SFC models, so I'm not going to get into those very deep. I have spent some time in them, and this has been my, my impression. Now, the modeling incorporates wealth in MMT, but here's the thing. When you, fo when you look at how MMT is uh, understood out there in the broad world, the many diverse people that we have at this conference being a great example, sectoral balances, inside and outside money, private quote surplus, I don't think MMT gives uh, wealth and attention it really deserves. Start off, I want to put across the magnitude of this. This has actually changed. I'll give you just last week's numbers. Household assets are 110 trillion, still liabilities of 15 trillion for a net worth of about 95, 96 trillion. It's all lot of money. Um, it's $832,000 for every household in America if you split up all those assets, three quarters of a million dollars in net worth. S my point being that really small percentage shifts in these numbers can have huge economic effects and they just um, don't get much attention. You pretty much never see these numbers in the newspaper. Though I did hear them on NPR the other day. I was delighted. I blame this on the national accounts. Before 2006, just a decade ago, when the integrated macroeconomic accounts were released, the U.S. Even had, didn't even have complete sector-by-sector -sector stock flow consistent accounting of assets and net worth. We didn't get the quarterly tables until 2012, only five years ago. Um, by complete stock flow consistent accounting, I'm just talking, oops, there we go. I'm just talking um, what you expect in a basic business statement, where the income statement fully explains, explains the change in the balance sheet. Um, in particular, changes as, uh, it, it explains the assets and net worth. Now, look at the flow of funds matrix right up front, pages one and two of the Z1 report. Um, it's a summary of flows tables and levels tables. Everything balances here, of course, but it's a question of what balances. Start with the levels tables. They don't include real assets. They only include financial assets. Um, they're not balance sheets. Uh, they're incomplete. 
Then you go to the levels tables, and again, they don't pay any attention to real assets, and they don't tally holding gains. So there's no way that the, um, that these flows and levels tables can tell you what happened to household assets and net worth. Now, I have to be fair, the Fed, the, the Z, the Fed has reported uh, balance sheet tables in various ways. From 85 to 95, they had the C9 tables, only for households and non-financial institutions. Uh, government, rest of world, financial corporations didn't have balance sheets. Those got rolled into the Z1s as the B tables in 97. Um, along with necessary reconciliation tables that include, among other things, uh, holding gains. But we still don't have B and R tables for financial, government, or rest of world sectors. And even for those two sectors that are covered by balance sheets, households, non-financial, business, um, you've got four tables, flows, levels, balance sheet, thank you very much, and uh, reconciliation. And it's really hard to follow the money if you're not an accounting and adept. I think most people here will agree that um, most economists are not accounting adepts. The IMAs include three accounts that um, are missing from the flow of funds matrix. Revaluations, holding gains, other changes in volumes. It's kind of a grab bag. I won't discuss it here, but it's pretty significant. And the balance sheet, of course. This is true for every, all seven sectors that it covers. For ref, uh, oh, one thing this lets you do is create a real sources and uses. Um, starting net worth, ending at the top, ending net worth at the bottom. You can't do this from the flow of funds matrix. You can only do it from the S tables, the, the uh, integrated microeconomic accounts, which are at the end of the Z1. I'm moving a little faster than I thought, so excuse me if I skim a bit. All right, so how does this, oh, that's what the revaluation account looks like, by the way. Um, notably with non-financial assets and change in net worth. What does this mean for MMT and for these key concepts? Back to the general idea people have of what MMT means out there in the world. Start with sectoral balances. This is something you're all familiar with. You've seen it a million times before. Um, the basic takeaway from it is I'm going to do the very simplified takeaway. Government deficit spending adds assets to private sector balance sheets. It creates a private sector, quote, surplus. But I think it's really important to be clear it creates a private sector surplus, not the private sector surplus. Here's why. Capital gains also create new assets on private sector balance sheets with no additional liabilities exactly what government deficit spending does. Uh, bank lending, on the other hand, of course, creates private sector assets and liabilities, so no, no change in net worth. But government de deficit spending and holding gains um, both put more assets onto private sector balance sheets. And the magnitude of this is pretty uh, phenomenal. Take a look at the red line there. That's five-year rolling average of holding gains added to household balance sheets. Here, I'm just showing what's generally called private surplus um, by MMTers. And you can see that holding gains completely overwhelms that in magnitude. Two thousand thirteen I love as an example. Household net worth and assets went up by ten trillion dollars that year. Again, reminder right now household assets are about a hundred and ten trillion. Seven trillion of that increase in private sector balance sheets was holding gains. And you can see, especially since sort of what seems to have been a big sea change that happened in the 90s in various ways, um, holding gains has really dominated these sec over these sectoral flows. So 
So another way of thinking about this, we talk about inside money and outside money, government deficit spending and uh, new bank lending. Um, outside money obviously creates new net worth because it adds assets. Inside money, bank lending, no change in net worth from that accounting act, though there may be economic effects from it. And holding gains do exactly the same thing. And here again, look at magnitude. These aren't summable, they're not sector equivalent, but it shows the magnitude. Green is holding gains. Um, I can't see the colors here. Orange is, uh, orange is government deficit spending. No, orange is bank lending and blue is government deficit spending. So you can see a significant magnitude. Here it is over 30 years. In terms of additions to household sector balance sheets, holding gains are, ten are, five, are, are five times either of the others. And again, this is invisible in the flow of funds matrix. The reason the reason holding gains are really interesting is because no sector issues them. Unlike uh, government deficit spending where you can post a liability to the government's account when new money is spent, uh, pretty much are required to, but though I think many people in this room will, that, will agree that that's sort of a pro forma accounting entry, it may not mean much, at least in the course of decades and centuries. But when asset holders mark up their assets, mark to market, which they do all the time, there are new assets with no associated liabilities on their balance sheet or any other balance sheet. This brings us back to monetary circuits, which you've seen a million times. They're generally closed loop balanced to zero constructs. That's how they're conceived. But the fact is that the government doesn't, th that the economy doesn't balance to zero. Assets increase, net worth increase, wealth increases. And this is truly ab nihilo wealth emerging from nowhere. By comparison, here's the IMA's accounting circuits, which uh, notably starts and ends with the balance sheet. Over here you see some explanatory accounts, like the financial accounts, but it just moves through the capital account, the other changes in volume account, and the revaluation account, basically, starting and ending with balance sheet. Now I want to make an important point here is Godley and Lavoie in particular, and MMTers, I'm basically preaching to the choir here, I think many or most people in in the room understand this completely. Godley and Lavoie get this. There are two matrices in the book that um, include capital gains. They, they're the two matrices in the book that don't balance to zero across the bottom. That's as it should be. They shouldn't and they can't because they balance to net worth. Um, so they totally get this, but they do shy away a bit. Oh, let me just I'll just show you this, yeah. Here's saving and holding gains combined to equal wealth accumulation. You can see that saving is a reasonably small slice of it. Here's the derivation of change in net worth from the integrated macroeconomic accounts. I think the top two lines are the most interesting. It's, there's two pieces of it. Capital formation is actually creating new stuff. Net lending borrowing is acquiring claims against other sectors and other sector stuff. They're completely distinct economic mechanisms that get bundled together under the concept saving. And here you can see that broken out in nominal dollars, here more usefully in 2015 dollars. When you talk about the private surplus in sectoral flows, you're looking at that little purple slice down there. That's net lending borrowing. I've combined firms and households here so that saving gets full credit because much saving is done by firms on behalf of households. 
So God Lane will have great discussion of Haig Simon's accounting, which starts with Haig Simon's income. It's basically pri primary income plus holding gains. It's, I, I like to call it comprehensive income, and I think somebody here might call it uh, uh, FGDP. Um, and that equals consumption spending plus net worth, so Haig Simon's saving would be a very simple to understand concept. Change in net worth is your saving, as opposed to the saving that we generally talk about. Now, even Godelin and Lavoie um, shy away from this a little. They don't actually go so far as to include uh, holding gains in income, but they say, but this, of course, is only a matter of convention. And I want to suggest that it's a pernicious convention because it hides uh, the primary mechanism of wealth accumulation. If you don't consider holding gains to be income, it's, it's, it's basically impossible to understand how wealth accumulates and how people get their wealth. Got a few other things, but I think I don't have time for them. Nope, that was it. One last sentence here. Until recently, since the dawn of the national accounts, economists, economists have been working with accounting that makes rich people's wealth and most of their wealth accumulation invisible. The policy implications of that are really profound. I'm going to actually overstate my case here. If we're not thinking and speaking and modeling in terms of comprehensive Haig Simons income, encompassing all the sources of wealth accumulation, if we're still thinking inside the traditional definition of saving that's embodied in the circular flow and the flow of funds matrix, we're part and parcel of the problem at the heart of Main Street economics. Godley and Lavoie say that it's, a, that it's only a matter of convention, and I'll just repeat, I think it's a pernicious convention. Come talk to me. I'd love to hear more of your thoughts. Thank you. All right, so we're uh, going to hold off questions for the end, and for now, Okay, anyways, my uh, presentation is introduction to SFC underscore models. Um, why the funky uh, misspelling? This, it's, uh, this is a Python package, and that's its name. If you're looking for it, well, that's what you have to look for. So I just put in as a bit of subliminal marketing. That, okay, when it comes time to download the thing, what was it called? Well, that's the name. Um, anyways, the, uh, this presentation, I hope to keep it brief, not too technical. Because um, the, the technical part of this is very much programming, and oh, there is one program in the audience, but uh, in general, I don't expect most of the people uh, here online who are, are programmers. So I'm just going to run through what is SFC models, what are its advantages, uh, brief mention with uh, relation to MMT, an example, uh, similar package and conclusions. Okay. Um, it's what is it? What it is, it's a Python uh, package. Python is a programming language, uh, if you're not familiar with it. It's, and what it does is uh, a bit different in terms of modeling. It, the user specifies the configuration economy as objects. You say, this is an economy, and it has these sectors. And you specify the sectors, you specify the parameters on the sectors out of an ex existing toolbox. And then what the, the package does, you then say, build the model, you call the main function, uh, and it, the, the, the model framework says, what are all the objects in the, in the economy? It can be a multi-country multi economy. And then it says, these are the implied equations, and then it attempts to solve them. 
and if you specify, if, if, you're, if you're missing the household sector, you tend not to find a solution. So, you know, you have to have a well-posed model, but it'll do its best to try and find a solution. And then it uh, puts out all the diagnostic information. You can see all the, all the time series. You uh, see all the equations. The simplification is done to the equations. And you can then graph them and, and so on and so forth. Um, it's an open source package like Python, so it's free. I'm currently the contributor to it, but it's uh, available on GitHub and it's possible. It's designed for collaboration. And um, it's this here, this is where the, the source code is. Um, but also, it's available as a Python package. Uh, you can use pip install S SFC models. Um, this is the thing you. You have to read the documentation, how to install Python and modules for whatever computer, each, each computer system, Windows, Linux, uh, Mac, has a different installation procedure. So you go to your local, figure out how to install a package for you know, the type of computer you're on. You install, the Python installation should be easy. And then uh, SFC models, it doesn't come with base Python, of course but it's in the Python package repository, so it's just a standard download, and then uh, it should run. Um, the advantages, well, it's free. Uh, transparent, everything is uh, available, basically, is in text files and logs. You see exactly what it's doing. It's not a, it's not a you, know, you know, if you don't pay attention, it looks like a giant black box. How does it generate this model? But everything shows up in a log file that you can see this is exactly what's happening. Um, flexibility. The, the, the reason why I've done this this way is that in general SFC models have way too many equations and they're uh, very complicated. I, I tried doing them by hand. I did my PhD thesis in applied mathematics by hand and I swore never again. <laughs> you know, it, it said, no, this is, no, we, with digital computers, we've invented them for a reason and that's it. So, um, I mean, it may be that there was a more systematic way of generating the equations from like an economic model description, but I didn't see it. It wasn't completely obvious. And I looked at it and said, I'm just going to build this package and have it do it for me. So this was my way of uh, fighting with all the models and Godley and Lebois. Um, you know, and other advantages, it's adaptable. I, I'm currently using a, a solver that, actually I got it from a MATLAB package, uh, someone had done for SFC models. It worked, it's, it solved all the models I've dealt with. It's good enough for, you know, it's been good enough to solve everything, but I haven't, you know, you, you so there, there's an example, there's an existing R package. If you want, it, it, that's, it has a solver. If you wanted to, you could then have Python ship the data into uh, a text file format that the R package could read, and then the R package solver can take over and it has diagnostic information. Uh, so it's very, Python is designed, it's, it's a scripting language developed by programmers for programmers, and it's designed to play nicely with everything that you can glue together different packages. Um, and finally, the other thing is it's uh, uh, robust programming tools. It might be from a programming point of view, uh, the entire package is covered by unit tests. Uh, what, what it means is that if you make a change, uh, let's say by accident, you can run the tests and it will tell, hey wait, you know, this existing functionality is broken. I mean, occasionally you're changing functionality, you want to, but generally speaking, you don't want to have a side effect, oh, this, this function is no longer appearing, so I'm run, I run tests against everything and how we've calibrated the whole package, because you're doing this against little pieces, each little, there's lots of little pieces, each one has its own test, and then for the whole package, to make sure it's generating the right output, I've taken selected models from Godly and Lavoie, and, is uh, that 10 minutes left or something? Yeah. Uh, the, um, so I've calibrated against what I thought were, not necessarily the, the most difficult models for the package to deal with, and I made sure that I could generate the same output as their models. And so that's how they come. So in terms of is there new theory, not really. Uh, it's just I've been basically targeting can I get the same results as Godly Lavoie? And in the future, okay, we know that this, the package is doing what we want. Then we modify it and then we can start going, hey, we want to do new research models. You go in, 
and you say, oh, I don't like this household sector behavior, you change, you, you change out the, ho you create a new household sector object that has new behavior that you want, you plop it in the thing, and you rebuild the model, and you see what happens. Like, for example, I've done things like, what if, what if you have a capitalist sector? You have capitalists and workers, and, and they have different uh, um, uh, propensities to save, blah, blah, blah. So, and it's just easy to plug it in and all ties together. Um, in terms of an easier presentation, like one of the advantages is if you give someone an equation, uh, a model, lots of equations, they're going to look at you blankly. But it's nice, the, the beauty of this is you can get, and this isn't, I'm going to say this, I don't even know what this example is from, but here's two scenarios and here's the debt GDP ratio. I don't know what the scenarios are, it doesn't matter. But the point is something like this, this gives uh, a reading you know, what's happening and it makes a lot more intuitive sense than uh, going blah, blah, though the marginal, you know, the, the curve will shift outright and you'll have new equilibrium. Like, what's that? This, to say, yeah, this, this, like, for someone used to dealing with economic time series data, something like this makes sense. You know, it's a simplified model. Real world systems don't, you know, real world economic series don't look exactly like that, but you're getting the idea. This is what happens under, let's say, a policy shift. Um, I skip over. Anyways, I think I skipped over relation to MMT. Anyways, the uh, model code, I'm just going to stand. I'm not going to go through this. I don't know if anyone can read this. But in terms of what you're actually doing, you say, like, mod equals model. Okay, so this starts it off. You say, can is country, it's Canada. And then you say, create a sector. Gov equals consolidated government. Boom. So you've just cre you've created a model. You stuck one country in it. And then you go, here's all the various uh, sectors. Uh, and then you um, add in uh, an exogenous, this, this is model sim from Godlin Lavoie. The government spending is an exogenous variable. And uh, you say, build the model and then get the time series. And then voila, this is your output. So that was it. That it was, the entire model was specified and generated with just a, a few lines of code. And it's all high level stuff. I mean, the you know, there's less parameters appearing because the, the default parameters match ones from model sim, but you could change the parameters to get different outputs. You can configure it, but, you know, the, uh, the I made it as simple as possible to get it on the slides. And then it generated all these equations. They're kind of, I might say, they're all pretty ugly looking. Like the exogenous variable, instead of being a nice, friendly G, it's gov damn good, like the, go the government's <laughs> demand for goods. That's how variables are built up. This is how it works, like HH, uh, household, after tax, income. So it's generated all those equations for you. They've got little ugly names. If you, know, if you want, someone could write a module to translate that to standard uh, economist speak. But the, the issue of um, the translation is what happens when we have two household, you can stick two household sectors in the same country well then how do you label that? Like it gets very complicated very fast, whereas, you know, the algorithmic way, well it's always going to work. Um, anyways, I did skip over the MMT slide, I couldn't see it from here. Anyway, so the um, similar packages, there's uh, Minsky by Steve Keen and uh, a programmer. It's uh, probably the closest in spirit, but it's a, conti um, the, it's a continuous time model. And I wanted a discrete time. Um, so it's a different, like the, obviously the equations are different. And I also wanted to take as my starting point the, the standard models in Godel and Lavoie. So that's sort of the, the distinction of that. There's uh, in uh, R, uh, Professor Antoine Godin uh, has an R package, but that one is designed like you supply the equations and it solves them for you and analyzes them. That means you have to solve the equations by hand and I don't want to do that, but that's the, you know, the other people do, academics might want to do that. But uh, that, that's, but they could be tied together. And then there was another Python one by Ken NT, and I'm not sure who Ken NT is. I mean, I, I don't know if I uh, had his real name in there, it was just his username. It was a Python implementation model, but it was a straight implementation of the, the models in Godin Lavoie in notebooks. It's like a mark, like it creates like a little report. Uh, it's like an R mark, if you know what R markup language is. Um, anyway, the uh, clean marks. 
The, I'm currently working on a user guide. It probably, if I'd been a bit more proactive, be finished. It's just I'm right now uh, going to have uh, edited after the conference, so it's too late. And it sort of explains how the package works. I mean, there's internal technical documentation, and there's examples that currently exist that are sort of in the package. But how the whole thing fits together, um, you know, it's it's sort of in this guide because you know it's 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 an unusual package because it's you know the the system is building equations for you. Well, how does it do that? And so this this gives the overall architecture. And, and uh, I have uh, some YouTube demonstrations where it, I have a graphical interface for running models. It's outside, because uh, I don't know if it's going to work on any other computers of my own, but it's in a separate package. You can get it also from GitHub. You can actually run the model and view the time series. And uh, going forward, my objective is, my next project would be start using this for like business cycle analysis. And I think I skipped all the way past, and then relation to MMT, which I didn't see the slide. Um, I mean, there's a lot of interest outside of academia. I'm, I have a blog, bondeconomics.com, and there's a lot of interest by non-economists in economic modeling, how do you do it. Uh, a tool like this, it's a free tool that you can say, a researcher can build a teaching model, and so it's a state-of-the-art teaching model and they can put it in the hands of the public and then they can run it and they can get feedback and it, it's, it could be used as a communications tool that way because since it's available to anyone using eViews is more difficult because you have to pay the you know a license fee although I mean, eViews is nice but you know uh, if, if someone just wants to see an example from my blog they're not going to uh, unlock a license fee just to run an example so this okay you have to do an installation but hey it doesn't cost anything and anyways, that is basically it. Um, you know the uh, you know what what going forward, like the objective is, I'll need researchers who are interested in adding models uh, to the system. I can work with them, say this is how it works, and then it's relatively easy. At least you know, I mean, you have to learn maybe a little bit of Python to add new behavior and extend it in whichever direction. And oh, I just going to say the uh, my. Um, yeah, so the I just want to point out the issues of equations. A two a two country module uh, from Ontario Economics. The uh, see the Golden Block count twenty seven equations. My, under my system, there's eighty three. Although I counted parameters as endogenous variables because they can change in the time series. So. But uh, this is, I mean, a simple, the simplest possible two-country model has that many equations. This is something you don't want to do by hand. And this is why, these are where this is up, because now all the accounting is being done for you automatically. Anyway, so that's the, you know, one of the uh, attractions of the package. Because if you want to do the Euro area, you're starting to look at a three-country. You need uh, core, periphery, and rest of world at the minimum. So now you're looking at three countries and so you're bloating that even more. And so that is the advantage of something like this, that it's handling the accounting for you. Okay, and that's... that's Hi everyone, my name is Oleg Ionets. I'm currently a PhD student, that's my hopefully last year in University of Hawaii. And I'm gonna talk about macroeconomic impact of financial system development. And so how I come to this topic prior to my PhD, I was actually working in the industry. I spent four years in private equity as investment analyst and manager, and then Mostly due to global financial crisis, I switched to investment banking and was a macroeconomist there. And what um, kind of motivated me to actually even go to academia is this change. When you, I w used to work in private equity and venture capital specifically, I 
you can feel that it really benefits the economy. You create new business, you modify existing business, you can see the economic impact that is beneficial for not just for yourself, for investors, but also for economy. You can kind of easily track that and there are actually research that support this. But when I switched to investment banking, I realized that there is no channel and actually most people, practitioners that I met, uh, they don't even believe in that. They don't care about the economy overall, how financial system support it, and they just kind of play a game by low sell high, that, that's it. And at, that's a post-crisis time, so that's motivated me to, to look into how financial system can benefit the economy. And in U.S., if you compare the both to the private equity and venture capital together, even though it's the most developed in the world, it's still around slightly more than 1% of the entire system. So you can see that that 1% cannot change um, like the economy, while the stock market, bonds market, banking takes all the rest. And if that huge 99% doesn't benefit in a way it should, the overall economy, then we have a problem. So with that in mind, I came to academia and I realized that, so my idea, my belief was how we can make the financial system to benefit the economy. When I came to academia, I realized that everyone believes here that it already benefits. So <laughs> there is another <laughs> problem. We need to show that it's not. And then kind of my research question downgraded to how to show that it, it's not really beneficial. And in that process, I realized there is another problem, how we measure that impact, how we measure economic impact of financial system development. And uh, there are problems there as well. So that come up with the two papers. I'm going to present the, uh, one of them. So first, uh, like go, going from bottom up, I created a systemic risk index as an indicator of countrywide indicator of systemic risk. And one of the problems in this topic when we analyze the economic impact of financial system is that we ignore the risk. We always look, oh, GDP goes up, stock market, oh, well, stock market goes up, GDP goes up, then there is an impact. But we, if we ignore the risk, we might end up with crisis. We might have this growth period with an extremely increasing risk that eventually will lead to crisis. So we, don't, we kind of have a fake growth. And obviously we have an example of that in 2008, which kind of motivated me in the first place to, to do that. And having a systemic risk in place, I created an analysis of this impact when we have economic growth and systemic risk together to see how the financial system development affect those two and then we can make some judgment about whether it's actually helpful or beneficial or not. So in this paper, we have, I have few objectives. First, I want to include systemic risk and to see how it happens now. Because again, everyone in mainstream economics believes that it's so beneficial, financial system, are doubtly beneficial for that. But if you include the risk, it actually changed the result. Because even latest research so shows that, well, sometimes it's not beneficial, but it's not harmful. The moment you include risk, you realize that it is harmful. Because yes, it might not affect the growth, but if you create high systemic risk, that it's a danger for the uh, overall economy. That changed the quality of results. Another kind of goal was to include stock bonds and banking in one model because again most researchers just take the stock market and ignore the rest while the rest is actually the majority of the system and the third point what I realized when I came to academia is that uh, there is a strong belief in again mainstream economics that things don't change in time so they basically use regression over time series and try to find some common things which work sometimes in many things but not with financial system because financial system is changing extremely and one of the basically uh, evidence of that is that 
or I'll switch to literature. So the existing literature, when I start working on this paper, everyone told me, when the Ross Levine, he already did everything, so why are you working? And the moment I saw it's like 1993, okay, he might did it in 1993, but that's so long ago. So this, this perception that things just stay the same, so if you had research in 1993, then it's still the same, uh, that completely opposite to the practical investments and financial system. The way I try to find something new and kind of the, the more innovative you are, the, the more you can check the, or understand the, where the system goes, it drives you the kind of your returns and your success. So I want to create a system that tracks in time and that allows changes in time. Well, that convention uh, literature wasn't very really successful to me because they, uh, well, the King Divine used the data from 60s to 1989 and confirmed that it was positive in that time. The newer research said, well, kind of sometimes positive, sometimes natural, but still there is no negativity, no negative impact there. That's when I turned to Himan Minsky and learned, well, that's quite a useful uh, work. And finally, I see something that I can relate to and, well, some other prominent alternative works, I would say. And that all led me to my model. So I'm going to skip some technicality. This um, from my previous paper about systemic risk. So just to give a hint what, how I estimate the systemic risk. It's a structural risk and a leverage risk. So leverage risk is pretty much standard things across all markets. So debt to equity, debt to GDP, debt to income. There is kind of no doubts on those indicators. Structural risk is a bit harder, but I use fundamental indicators for the stock market and I use ratio of what I call non-productive loans to productive loans. So we have mortgage and consumer loans ratio to business loans. And these are very simple indicators in terms of risk and you would say that kind of what can you get from there but apparently you can get quite a lot. So that's a systemic risk, just systemic risk for United States index. And you can see that, so it is constructed with a baseline of one. So one is the baseline, that's where you should be. And you end up with, so that's a, before the crisis, you can see that how it nicely it works. It shows the tremendous increase in systemic risk before the crisis. So that growth period we had was correspondent with the increase of these fundamental indicators. So first, to say that there was no way to predict crisis is kind of ridiculous because, again, I didn't use anything out of art, just basic f fundamental indicators. But also we can see that the financial system, in particular in the United States in the recent times, uh, was associated with high risk, and kind of extreme risk. Then also the system allows you to go kind of deep in, uh, inside. You can see mortgage-backed securities risk as well as in the may contributor to a bonds component of the risk. I use seven countries to compare basically to United States. So if I just use the risk of United States, everyone say, well, that's your model is like that. Well, in fact, that's why I have seven other developed countries. You can see we. Uh, again, one is the baseline, so you can see that most of them, except Germany, they're all about the baseline. However, it's around two on average, while United States is going really up. Thanks to US dollar and ability to introduce it as an international currency, mostly so you can take more debt, basically, and your fundamental indicators are kind of boosted, but still it goes in the kind of the pardon before the crisis, you can see that uh, it was kind of easily predicted. And the dot-com bubble also had a spike here, so that systemic risk indicator helps a lot to understand what's going on in the economy during the growth period. Now, combine this with this, that's how our financial system grew in the last 22 years. 
four times on average. Pretty much all the markets grew four times, which is an extremely uh, successful, I would say, growth for the financial system. But what we have is just, I combine the four things that we're talking about. This is the financial system growth compared the, to median income and GDP. So this is the median income growth for the 22 years was just 11%, while again, investors got 400% on stock, uh, I mean, on financial system in general. And we also see the corresponding increase of systemic risk during the growth period. So my point from this basically graph analysis to prove two things. First, there is no correlation, there is no relationship between the financial system success and the economic success, which in a way is an obvious thing that everybody knows unless you talk to a macroeconomist. Then it completely stops and <laughs> then nobody knows. So it's a bit funny to present it to say, well, that, that's obvious, but let's make it obvious in macroeconomy and then start from that our analysis. And the new thing is that when we, have the growth, we had the growth before the crisis, we had this. And the same, we also have a spike in risk recently as well. So this means our financial system is not structurally right. We put more money in the system, we have more risk, but we don't have an economic growth which is a really dangerous, that well, our success, what we call success, might not be a real success. We just create more risk and end up with another bubble, which will have another crisis. And again, compared to other countries, it's really useful, because if you have just one country, uh, you say, well, that's how the world is. Well, it's not. If you see, United Kingdom is the closest to the US, but still numbers are way less. So risk are less, and income is doing way better as well. But you go to Germany, you see a completely different picture. The risks are too low, I would say. It's like way below the baseline. And it's not a good thing, too. They might be more helpful for their, especially European Union in general, to kind of be more risky. But we have, you see, financial system goes right, uh, right along with the uh, income, so the kind of everything goes in the same way. We have quite successful, uh, I would say, a balanced economy. You don't have one side is kind of successful and another is not. So here, I can say there is a relationship. We can see that German financial system kind of corresponds to German economy, while in US we see the disconnect. France is a bit different, but I'm gonna skip. Uh, pretty much all the countries are doing way better in terms of risk and returns and median income compared to United States, which is a problem. So it's another thing that when I talk about median income, all economists say, well, that's a new, everybody knows this problem, that's because China steals jobs or robots steal jobs. Well, all other developed countries should experience the same, but they don't. They, they experience something, but still they, they do better in terms of median income and in terms of risk, too. So that's a kind of point and main point. And starting from this, also I can take a bit, a bit of uh, why we have that, a bit of practical reasons and what we can do with that. So why we have that... Um, and practically it's because we have a lot of long-term investments uh, go to a short-term, uh, long-term capital goes to short-term investments, so we have a boost uh, financial system in terms of, again, those risk indicators, but we don't have that development because our economy runs on a long-term capital from macroeconomic perspective. And that, that's the thing we can I would say, again, focus our policy, and that's for future research. So. And perception of real estate is, is also a big problem. And the monetary policy in effectiveness is a kind of result of this. So if we have a system that just doesn't work for the economy, our monetary policy will be ineffective. So those interest rates will have, like, you can put a lot of money in that system, you will not have any. So that's a short presentation. Thanks. Thank you.
Jacob. Um, I'm really enjoying the session so far and I'm going to echo a couple of things that have been said. Uh, Steve mentioned that economists are not adepts at macro accounting. I highly concur with that. And Ole just talked about fake growth and these are both elements of my presentation. I thought I would start with three inspirational slides. Uh, I'm, I'm just starting to read this book and I'm surprised that Minsky talked about issues of measuring national income and as you can see he thought it was very contingent. Then when I saw who was moderating this panel, I added another quote from a 2011 paper, uh, also to the same effect, and my own work on the financialization of GDP also puts uh, measurement of national income in the same light. I'm running pretty quickly because I have 60 slides, that's about four per minute. This is more interesting to me because this is not just about theory, but this Financial Times um, correspondent actually claimed in an article that if banking had been subtracted from GDP, like people like Kuznet said, I did that in other indicators, maybe we could have seen the financial crisis. In other words, GDP is not a good leading indicator because of finance. And let's see why. So how come most of the people who predicted the financial crisis were heterodox? Well, if you look at um, the list, and there's two papers that list them, um, Bezemir, 2010, and James Galbraith, 2009, and these are the names. Theoretically, they viewed money as credit instead of just a numerator or a veil or a mainstream view of neutral money. Their focus in terms of data was on private debt instead of the usual media and academic focus on public debt. And they used methodologies which were accounting models, not just SFC but others, to look how stocks and flows balance. So theoretically, I don't have to tell you about all this. The mainstream view can be uh, considered like the Wuxalian view of uh, Loanable funds, where money is exogenous, it's uh, neutral, it's banks just intermediate money, whereas the endogenous money view is banks create money by making loans, and it has an important feature in the real economy. In terms of data, this is the same data that Steve used from the S tables of the flow of funds. Um, there's a lot of hysteria about public deficits, but if you look at the chart, private debt, including financial debt, which is really rising high, that's the green line, is much bigger as a percentage of GDP. And that's what those economists who saw the crisis coming focused on. So that's the second difference. The third difference is methodological. They used stock flow consistency principles. I'm relatively new to this. I just attended a workshop in Paris with um, Lavoie and Godin and others. Um, but I think that's one key of their success. Some of the strengths of stock flow consistency include an explicit examination or analysis of the financial sector, which is left out of many mo mainstream models, enforcing consistency of stock and flows, tracking sto stocks, adding up constraints, time is more precise and not just um, abstract. There are some weaknesses. There's two types of SFC models, those that are numerically solved. Um, the stability is pretty local. There's mathematical complexity. They're sensitive to parameters. By contrast, SFC models which are analytically solved are simpler but the price they pay is that there's less detail and realism. But unlike economists, policymakers and a lot of CEOs, I suspect, don't really look at SFC models and still don't. They look at major aggregate like GDP. Uh, and GDP can have a big impact on a lot of uh, market and political situations. So my main research question in this paper, which is relatively new, it's coming up uh, next week on the New School website, can we use the benefits of the SFC models without their weaknesses? Because SFC is a method, it's not a model. And apply that to something more parsimonious like GDP. In other words, can we make GDP stock flow consistent? Um, very quickly, why, how money and credit are viewed in national accounts. I'm basically answering the question, why haven't MMT and SFC influenced the way we look and measure our economy, not just modeling? One, and this is a quote from 1947, Tialin Kupons, measurement without theory. He was criticizing Burns and Mitchell business cycle paper from the NDER by saying it is groping for guidance without any theoretical reference. And he said, instead, 
we have to use theory in the process of measurement, not separately. And there's a big gap in economics between measurement and theory. And that goes to Steve's point about the ignorance of many economists about national accounting, macro accounting. Um, it's a separate branch of study, outsourced to official statisticians. They don't teach that in schools anymore. I won't dwell on that. Even critiques of GDP, like all these books that I cite here, don't go into the theoretical uh, issues in GDP. They say it doesn't include welfare and so forth. Um, so as a result, no, there's another reason why MMT and SFC have not influenced uh, GDP. Most people think GDP and other macro indicators are data, which comes from Latin datum. It's given to us. But I argue that this is a false dichotomy because it's more like a spectrum. You have real data, like the unemployment rate, which is a straightforward measurement. You have full-fledged models, whether DSG, CG, or others, with behavioral equations and identities. National accounting is more, I would put in the middle, implicit models, which have accounting identities. They don't try to explain causation, but they have relationships. So they're much more complex than statistics, but not as explicit as other models. And therefore, people think we don't need theory there, and uh, it's just a statistical construct. But it makes a lot of difference if you look at the history of treatment of finance in uh, GDP. It changed in 1968 based on a United Nations decision rather than academic discussion. R&D was reclassified in 2008 from intermediate consumption, which was deducted from GDP, to investment, fixed investment. So now it's part of GDP. U.S. GDP went up by half a trillion in 2013. Not related to academic research. This is uh, what Brett Christopher is called technopolitical process. As a result, you have an ad hoc treatment of finance and GDP. This is the only place in GDP where, um, sorry, going too fast, where there's uh, treatment of finance. Financial intermediation services indirectly measured, FISM. Basically, it's the net interest margin that banks make. So this shows you banks is just taking money from A, giving it to B, service providers. They don't create money. They don't produce anything. Um, and it violates a lot of the principles of stock flow consistency because it only shows the payment for the loan. It doesn't actually show the actual loan, either an asset or as uh, a liability. It fits well with this loanable funds theory, but it doesn't go into GDP. So this is how it violates everything. So I did something here that I haven't seen anywhere else. People model economies as stock flow consistent models. I model GDP as a stock flow consistent model. So this is based on the national accounts. Uh, this is not a balance sheet. So the minus is the use of funds, and the plus is a is, um, source of funds, not assets liabilities. And you can see that GDP is the gray line, which is the sum of consumption, government, investment, changes in inventories. And on the banking side, there's that net interest, but there's no changes in any stocks equivalent to the one you have over there. So that's, that's the asymmetry that I'm a debt fund. The loans are there in the financial account, table 2.9, but they're not used to calculate GDP. There's been some previous effects to juggle economics and debt. Um, theoretical, Steve Keen's idea of uh, including debt as part of aggregate demand. It's been criticized by Lavoie and so forth. There's a big discussion about that. Um, Lavoie himself actually shows something similar in his book, Monetary Economics, because he shows a relationship between inventories and debt. I won't go through all this. This is in the paper. I'm basically rearranging some of Keynes' um, functions. There's been some empirical work done to try to definancialize GDP. Um, Nordhaus and Tobin didn't talk about finance, but they used a lot of other expenses as um, instrumental. They deducted them from GDP. Sheik and Tonak in their Marxian version of national accounts uh, excluded financial services. Uh, Basu and Foley excluded financial services. My work actually went further and deducted them. And this is just a graph of some interesting indicators. The blue is GDP. Uh, the other two are Foley's non-financial GDP and non-measured GDP. And my measure of final GDP is in purple. So I chose it. all the alternative measures are much better correlated with employment. But these are just within national accounts. So the problems with these work, including my own from the past, I'm critiquing my own work here, is they're just within the confines of GDP. They don't look at the balance sheets. They don't look at actual debt. And they also all aggregate 
productive finance, which I think Oleg mentioned before, with unproductive finance, speculative. So if you take it out of GDP, you're kind of throwing the baby out of the water. Instead, what I build on here is uh, Schumpeter's idea through Dirk Bezemir's recent papers on the functional differentiation of credit. Credit flows to the real sector have a liquidity effect. They're already included in the GDP. Credit flows to the financial sector deep in the financial system, but don't show up in, the, in GDP. And you can see here the three types. This is the neoclassical loanable funds theory. One firm in the real sector lending to another. Credit to the real sector is from banks to the real economy, and credit to the financial sector is speculative credit within. So this is a quote from Bezemir, money is not neutral, and unproductive credit harms GDP growth. And he has this whole chart, which I won't go into. I'll have to accelerate a bit. The, the bottom line is that speculative finance, unlike productive finance, has an opportunity cost for the real economy. Um, the red line here is inflation based on GDP deflator, so it's much, much less important in recent years, but leverage is much, much more important. Anyway, I'm doing a variant of that. I'll skip all the formulas, and I come up with debt-adjusted GDP, which is real GD the change in real GDP deflated by a systemic leverage index, not risk index, which gives you debt-adjusted GDP. It's very similar to my previous work and Foley's work, although it comes from a completely different perspective, so it's kind of striking that the results are the same. If you account for debt, your GDP is much closer to employment, and this is in longs. So you can see nominal GDP is way up there, uh, real GDP, and so forth. So the new measure is theoretically more consistent because the expenditure side is Keynesian, and the money side is also Keynesian, endogenous, whereas in national accounts, the money is, well, rising, if, you, if you'd like. Methodologically consistent, there's no black holes. You see where the loans are. They're included in stocks of uh, debt. And this is a new table. The only real difference here, where here you had the question marks earlier, and these were underneath the line, not counted with GDP. These are now the equivalent. So these are financial inventories, if you will. These are real inventories. And here you have the new balances. So basically, instead of just having flows and changes of stocks on the real side, and before you had only this, now you have uh, symmetrical treatment on both sides. So it has very interesting empirical uh, features, as I said, it matches employment. Some of the implications are growth has been slower than if you don't look at uh, debt. The peaks and troughs have been more pronounced. The great moderation. I want to talk about that very quickly. Um, this is the coefficient of variation of real GDP versus debt adjusted GDP. The real moderation story, great moderation story, is that this dropped, but that doesn't take into account debt. If you take into account debt, volatility doubles. And you can see that in the chart here. Uh, two minute, one minute on final conclusions. What does it mean? People are worried about inflation, but that's been declining. But a lot of uh, economists ignore the rise of leverage. And this leads to even heterodox economists being kind of schizophrenic because we use heterodox models with money endogenous, but the data is you know, classical. To move forward, we've got to teach more about macro accounting in schools. It's been done in the New School in 1941. And maybe that will help us have a scientific revolution in economics because unlike Bezemir, who thinks we just have to include debt and money in our accounts, in our models, I say, if the data does not include money, why would people bother looking at models that include money? So there's a contradiction there. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think uh, it'd be best if we got everyone who spoke to come up and we can field questions. You guys, uh, be mindful of the microphone when you guys are speaking. Yeah. Just pass it around. So, uh, all very interesting presentations here. I'm going to take uh, advantage of my power as moderator and start this off with uh, a question to Jacob, which is um, really interesting move towards uh, thinking a little bit deeper about how GDP is measured and. I know that when I looked at these measures, there is some discomfort in removing broad sectors in order to get GDP to look something uh, 
more akin to employment, which we think should be highly correlated um, uh, to Okun's law. And, but uh, also when you look at the just it, uh, it computed measures of GDP, which the financial interview services is one, it's a very small part of GDP, right? It's maybe, it's got to be less than 1%. Mm -hmm. And the and if table 7 <laughs> in the NEPA, right, when you look at the total imputed measures, the owner-occupied housing, you, but it, it, it's the majority of that, but it's still, now I think it's 6% of GDP is imputed, just from table 7. Um, but in the, in their, uh, Academy, if you only have the FISIM, I'm just wondering how you uh, consider the adjustments for the other imputed measures. Thank you. That's a very good question. People who do know about national accounts a little bit usually know about FISIM, which is net interest. It used to be the most important source of banking income, but it's been much, much smaller recently. So that's now 10% of banking income. The other 90% is from fees. And that's not included in FISIM, it's included in value added. So if you look at the value added, or GDP by output by sector, you have agriculture, industry, yada, 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 fire, financial and real estate. And these are not interest uh, payments, they are fees. And that's 33% of US GDP. So that's huge. So the FISM, I'm only using for illustration. You don't deduct that actually. The fire sector, I deducted before fully did, but now I'm not even looking at that. I'm looking at the actual flows of, of loans, which are not just, um, not just interest, um, they, they affect the economy by creating fragility, and that goes to the issue of the risk that Owen was talking about. So it's not so much just the money getting in or out, but increasing the fragility of, of the system. About uh, holding wealth in financial actions. Uh, here, yeah, I think you have, uh, by the way, in 2005, I predicted the financial crisis in a book of mine, so it, it has a doxy counters to tell you why. The point of the matter is, there's a counting rule about how, if I have a piece of paper, uh, now it's an electronic lit, uh, uh, computer, which is a financial asset, the accountants tell you how to evaluate it on the balance sheet. If it is uh, what I call a liquid financial asset, that is, there's a market where you can resell it quickly, then you mark to market. If it's an illiquid financial asset, like a bank loan held by a bank, it's marked to cost until the guy defaults. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand. I was talking about how it's done in the integrated macroeconomic accounts. Well, this, the, is the point. this is the point I want to make. The global financial I'll just say it's done mark to market there using uh, sectoral indexes. But, but the global financial uh, crisis occurs because you have these mortgage-backed derivative securities, which were sold by investment bankers as a liquid asset. It was a Goldman Sachs called them as good as cash. You could sell them. There was a market to resell, but the market was not an orderly one. And so what happened was a couple of these things got defaulted upon, and, and, and then everybody wanted to get out of them. And so the, lies, so the price falls to zero even though a lot of them were still paying interest. Right, and a huge amount of the arguments going on through that whole thing was, do we have to mark to market? The accounting industry sort of got bought off at that moment and said, no, 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 you don't have to really. Let's, let's um. now go to uh, quantitative easing. In, in the Bureau of Labor, all these uh, securities, which still had markets, but prices were going to the assets become taxable. So what did the Fed do? The Fed became a market maker. It went in and bought these things to keep the prices up, keep people's balance sheets up, people's institutions and so on. Now, it seems to me that has nothing to do with GDP. It has something to do with the, the way we keep accounting records. Right. Do you, do you have a question? The question is, when you say holding... Uh, Gains. It's gains as well. It's really, it's, it's not wealth. It, it, it's merely an accounting number. Again, I it's said that assets, I was, I was treating wealth as assets and net worth, balance sheet assets and net worth, as tallied by the integrated macroeconomic account. They're never going to be perfect, no more than GDP estimation is going to be perfect. Um, but I think it's a 
remarkable job that uh, literally thousands or tens of thousands of economists, PhD economists, have been, been involved in struggling away in their statistical caves. Um, I think it's a remarkable piece of work, and it, uh, it's well worth criticizing and analyzing, but uh, amazing work. One of the outputs is um, it generates a, a log file, like it's a, a tab delimited file, so like a, a text spreadsheet that you can read in. It has every, every single variable has its full time history up, up that can be calculated. And then you can do, see, I, I think I skipped over. I mean, one of the things you could do is build a graphical front end to be actually straight, it's designed to be that you could actually make a drag and drop, build an economy, and then view it. My, my graphical viewer, pro, it's like SFC GUI, it allows you to step through, like it, it, it runs the whole model, then you can just step through, here's a list of all the variables, and then you have to find the one, because there might be 100 variables in there, find the one you want, and you get the little time series. It's not beautiful plotting, but it works. But you can, extra, you know, you can pull them out of a spreadsheet. I mean, I would probably do it in, um, you know, if I want to do pre ones, I actually do it in R. I mean, I just uh, read the spreadsheet from R. Your, uh, your analysis that the uh, systemic risk or the, the financial sector risk in uh, Germany was actually very low. And, and if, if I remember what happened in 2008 and 9 and 10 in the uh, German financial sector, uh, quite a number of banks collapsed. So, uh, well, just, yeah, well, first we. Something in the presentation, but yeah, well, first I meant kind of it was reducing in, instead of increasing after the global financial crisis. So, uh, it, and nowadays it's really low. But before it was uh, higher, it's one thing. And another thing is that we have an interconnected financial system. So we might have a, a stable bank that will collapse because it was involved with an unstable bank. And that's kind of what happened to a large extent. But um, again, during the crisis, they had a uh, higher than normal risk, but just compared to the United States, a, a lower risk. Yeah. 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 Just to comment on that, one of the interesting things, again, my wealth obsession, um, one of the interesting things about Germany is that it has one of the lowest median household net worths in Europe. Most people don't realize this, um, and that is because an awful lot of German households' future income is not coming from their own savings and their own wealth and income from wealth. The whole lot of their stuff is covered by uh, future government flows. And of course, that doesn't get capitalized onto the individual household balance sheet. Um, and I think that may be a factor, I was thinking, maybe it is a factor that makes them look less and makes them look less fragile and maybe actually makes them less fragile. I have no idea. I have a question for Oleg. Um, we have some parallels in our work in terms of productive versus not productive loans. I was just curious, how did you classify or d define what is productive loan versus what, what is not? Well, yeah, that's, that's a quite subjective thing. There actually, there are a lot of things that never were studied, so you need to make a judgment. Yeah and kind of leave it for future research. But, well, I choose the business loan as, as uh, productive and mortgage loans as not productive because, again, there, there is idea that comes from, again, mainstream mostly that, oh, we're gonna push 
like demand for mortgage and then it will end up with a you know supply but uh, again coming from investor that invested in real estate it doesn't work like that it works a little bit but what it does like New York you will buy if you have more debt, you will buy still the same house in Manhattan just for million of dollars and more expensive. Unless you have infrastructure that is coming like with the same speed and in, f in front of real estate. So as a construction, if you make decision, you make, um, you need an infrastructure already at place. Then you can, oh, okay, I will build a new houses in this area because there is a communication to downtown. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a business perspective there. If there is no infrastructure, it's just like a dead project. So for I think real estate perception it was the biggest kind of problem that economists believe and macroeconomists believe, oh, that will create supply and will run the economy. But with especially again in US infrastructure was a bit of you know, underinvested. <laughs> so with this combination, it will not work. It will just drive the price of the existing nice houses up. So that is un the key unproductive. Well, consumer loans, I guess everyone agrees that it's not really productive. Well, and business loans are productive. But if you go to, uh, I had a discussion that, let's say we go to China, that some business loans might be not productive too, if you kind of push, in, you know, leverage business too much and maybe that you have again not competitive business then you might have even problems with that part so yeah it should study more but in US I think that small part of business loans we can take as productive at least yeah oh, hi Carlos um, question for Steve uh, you talked very interesting work about um, how net worth is sort of left off the, you know, the flow of funds. And, and a balance sheet is you know, it's your assets minus the liabilities. Um, has anyone done any work looking at the government sector's uh, net worth? I know um, just in the energy, the Institute for Energy Research estimated like the value of mineral resources, oil, gas, coal, it's like 100, gosh, 150 trillion. And if you look at that in any way, like there's a Twenty trillion dollar gross public debt. You would say that the net worth would be just, just alone in mineral. We're not looking at real assets. And yeah. Tax, you know, it's there's a huge. I haven't found it. I think some of the environmental economists. Um, try to, I mean, basically the, what you'd have to do is start with what is the, ne the asset value of the earth before there were humans? And then you'd have to work your balance sheet forward from there, which is kind of unrealistic. Um, but I think uh, some of the environmental economists that I've only looked at, some, do try and take that kind of approach where the, uh, there is a balance sheet um, that nobody owns. But because we say like, oh, when the government spends, it's creating much money out of nothing. You could also say that it's lending, it's issuing money against, you know, the assets of the United States. You could say that those, I mean, sure, if you wanted to do the, the total uh, you, uh, federal government balance sheet, um, I mean, there, there's the, all these arguments all the time, and they say, oh, well, look at liabilities for the next 75 years or through infinity. Um, yeah, they, 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 they load up the liability side, look, we're broke, right? Well, you go, well, look at tax receipts through infinity. Look at all of the oil we're going to extract from the ground through infinity. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm babbling a little. I don't really know the answer. I think the environmental economists maybe the ones who are trying to actually nail that government balance sheet or the collective balance sheet that we're all drawing from. Yeah, and then what, um, you know, the average, I didn't, astounding, like a third of GDP is the fire sector. And that's um, revenues? That's financial fees. That's net revenues, fees minus costs. Six trillion dollars in financial fees? Well, the finance sector includes real estate, which is bigger than banks, and insurance. And so it almost seems like the more, the way to, to like the, a low tax real economy,
economy is shifting as much as the fire sector, you know, the financial economy to the government. Because, you know, if, if instead of direct student lending, you had direct mortgages. You know, that's fee revenue coming in to fund government at no additional cost to the real economy, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty conservative. That means you can have taxes be that much lower. <laughs> and maybe less risk taking. Right. Yeah. Right. This is Carlos Muchas in the back. By the way, you should get to know this fellow. He knows a lot of stuff. My name is Dimitri Journey. I've been a uh, well, MMT guy since 2011. And it, it changed my life so much that I've run for Congress now twice. And I'll be running again next year in South Carolina. But because of that, I look at MMT from the perspective of if every truck builder knew this, how would the world be? And if everyone in Washington knew this, 90% of the arguments that are happening in, in our government all the time would stop. And that's why I, I decided to run for Congress, that I want to be one of those people that's going to help with that. But everything you guys are talking about, I think is interesting because it, it seems like you're, you're trying to either prove the case for MMT, and you're almost like on the verge of coming up with a model that people could use on a website and play with. Um, and you said something about uh, stopping hiding the wealth or hiding the gain of the wealth or something like that. Um, I mean, it just, again, I'm always looking for tools to convince Bubba, my voters, that uh, this is real and that we don't have to fight about this stuff. I mean, do you, do you see what you're all doing in, in this model building as proving MMT or trying to convince other people or, or what? Just a discussion point, not so much a, a question. Well, from my perspective, I mean, I'm, I'm right, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm aiming at uh, trying to convince people. I mean, I'm, um, so I'm, I'm Canadian with very obscure Canadian prairie populist politics, and there's, I mean, there's like a few of us outside of old folks' homes now. So it's, you know, I, I don't get too involved in, in the political discussions, but you know, it's, it's aimed more at technical audience. But yeah, you're trying to get the models out and convince people that they work, and you know, that's certainly the objective. And selling books is a side effect of that. Well, as for me, I really want to persuade and actually people and uh, develop a policy as well for financial because we are uh, basically we didn't learn much well we probably learned but <laughs> the other economists didn't learn much from the crisis which you know result will result in another crisis that's how system works uh, and that's a bit dangerous so because if you, and usually it's a larger crisis, so if you don't learn from that crisis, uh, it's kind of our perspective and not nice. So I try to show um, to yeah, people and policy, financial policy, it's important. You cannot just leave the system and believe in some, some free, free, you know, that hand that no one sees. <laughs> that, that's how it is, it's just you need to. Uh, I was also discussing, it's like in real life, you cannot get anything nice without putting some work and efforts into that. And then in this macroeconomy, you just hope that everything will happen without any efforts. That that's, this just doesn't work. And But still, that's a mainstream belief, so I just try to persuade and find that. I think, well, I think we are growing and this, you know, like, uh, this theory actually became more and more popular, so I think we, in future, we have chances. Yeah. I like your question about trying to convince, because especially when it comes to measuring the wealth of nations, data, people think it's, it's numbers and it's objective, but if you look at the history of national accounting from the 17th century on, it was really uh, rhetorical. So people used it to try to show that Germany was uh, I'm sorry, France was stronger than England, and England was stronger than the Netherlands, and labor should be taxed, and it was very policy-oriented. And since GDP was uh, taken over by governments in the 1930s, people forgot that. So my next book, hopefully, will be the rhetoric of GDP, 
because there's a lot of messages that go in there and we don't know about them, even as economists. So I think there's a big uh, chunk of work to be done. I just couldn't, I couldn't agree more. The, um, I'm pretty sure Carlos has heard me rant this in various blogs, that accounting is rhetorical. You're always trying to explain a position, prove a position. You're always trying to describe how the world works in a convincing way. So yes, accounting is always rhetorical, and we always need to be looking at what are the underpinnings of our rhetoric. Uh, is it valid rhetoric? Is it ax grinding? And if it's ax grinding, is it still re valid, like mine? <laughs> follow-up to that and to anybody in the room, I, I'm really here to try to develop the bumper stickers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, we need to get it down to three or four words that we can give to every American and they go, yeah, I got it. I mean, if you think back through when we found out about MMT and what was it that, that one day you woke up and you go, oh my God, this is real. And I've, I've been blinded my whole life until now. <laughs> It's the road to Damascus. Yeah. <laughs> how, do we, how do we distill that down to something that's going to be a bumper sticker and then go to a website where we can get millions? We need 30 million people to believe this stuff in the next decade. Or, I mean, we, well, know, we know where the world is going. Let's take that discussion uh, out of this. Exactly. For I just, just wanted to say that. Yeah. But thank you for all the panelists. Thank you, all of you.